<clears throat> Hello, um, today is the 6th of April 2023, and I will make two presentations, but both are related. Brickwork or bricks and concrete in Bangladesh. And I, I decided to speak about this subject because I'm impressed about the quality of some of the buildings built in Bangladesh, especially using bricks, but not just bricks, concrete as well. We'll start with the, the following, um, the following uh, uh, building. Uh, <clears throat> this um, uh, Shapotik, Banuesca Stapotik, is the name of the, uh, uh, or I don't know what it is actually, and uh, to my shame, I should know, and I thought I knew, but <clears throat> I imagined it was the, the architect, the name of the office of, uh, of the architects who built this mausoleum with a chandelier, as it is called, of skylights. It is this work that made me, made me decide to make this presentation, because I think it's a very big, vigorous work in the good sense uh, of the word. Yes, this is the name of the, the architecture studio. A series of cylindrical skylights and brick turrets feature in this Bangladesh mausoleum, which was designed as a reference to traditional Islamic buildings, named the Shah Muhammad Moshkin Khan mausoleum. The turreted brick volume was designed as a dargah or shrine to house the graves of a local religious leader's family. Aerial view of Shah Muhammad Moshin Mosh, uh, Khan Mausoleum in Bangladesh. Um, well, there was a picture. I should have edited this uh, text. Um, I apologize. So Stapotik has created a mausoleum in Bangladesh. Uh, I guess, uh, I'm confused. I I, uh, I am sorry about this. I didn't review uh, the text I posted from uh, Bizin, and I think it was uh, it was um, uh, intertwined with pictures, which I show later. I don't know what meaning portal in Persian. Uh, Dargah, I guess. Uh, Dargah is a home for the grave of a revered religious figure. Metaphorically, the Dargah is the home for the earthly body. The studio continued. And this is the building. And I think it is impressive in its simplicity and in, in its uh, woven work with bricks. And there is concrete work at the top. The so called chandelier of skylights was done with concrete. But the building is, uh, is um, uh, you know, very vigorous and uh, you know, it shows that uh, some meeting between modernity and tradition is possible. <clears throat> it's also possible that the work of Louis Kahn in Dhaka inspired architecture of the present and not just of the present. He worked in Dhaka uh, the beginning of the 70s. He died, I think, in 1973. So, you know, about 50 years ago, the impact of the work of Louis Kahn in Dhaka had consequences. And the architect I'm going to talk uh, about the in the next presentation was instrumental also in, in emancipating the architecture of Bangladesh. <clears throat> you know, this humble material, the brick, indeed in the right hands, with the right sensitivity, with the right imagination, could create wonders. That's why Louis. Uh, that's why uh, uh, the Frank Lloyd Wright said that, uh, "Give me a brick, and I will uh, transform it in its equivalent in gold." This is not an expensive building, and this is not an expensive structure. This is not, you know, uh, something that, uh, um, you know. Uh, cannot be done in almost any country on, on this earth. But there is also something else. The fact that in this, you know, country without uh, the greatest uh, economy, there is still a spiritual life. There are still spiritual concerns. 
And I think I have the, the deepest respect for a country which, beyond counting uh, the money, the spiritual life is still considered and felt seriously. Because life is not just production and consumption, it's not just stomach and, and, and pocket, but it's also contemplation. It's also spirit. And unfortunately, particularly in the mercantile West, the spiritual life is, um, is often forgotten, I'm afraid. So, but you look at this building, this is a modern building but a modern building also connected with a certain tradition uh, uh, in, 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 in the place where it was built. Let's read further about the building. Four doors made from locally sourced iron bars and sheets of entry, uh, offer entry points on each face of the building and feature patterns informed by Islamic motifs. The pattern on the doors is inspired by Islamic motifs and designs, said Ahmed. The star on the gate represents five family members of the Prophet, where Allah remains in the middle, while the cuttings in the pattern allow for ventilation and visibility when the door is closed. Uh, you see, there is no contradiction between what we call tradition and what we call modernity. The building is... Uh, is uh, very attractive, not to say more, and inspiring exactly because he's able to, to marry what we call the past with what we call the present, and maybe even the future. And I like the weaving of the, of the bricks very much because the act of weaving is, is um, uh, you know, uh, a primeval act in architecture. If we consider that the second part of the word architecture, meaning texture, comes from text, T-E-K-S, which means T-E-K-S, which means to weave. Now, I will show another, uh, another uh, religious building in Bangladesh by this uh, excellent uh, um, lady architect in Bangladesh, Marina Tabasum. She built a very uh, um, uh, important, uh, although modest, uh, mosque, and she received an important prize from the Aga Khan Foundation for it. It's this uh, by Tur Roof uh, Mosque, by to Bait Ur Roof Mosque in Dhaka. Dhaka, sorry, written with a one K. I make a lot of mistakes these days, and I mean today, and I apologize. Let's read a little bit about it, and you, we are going to see pictures of this mosque built in Dhaka by this Bangladesh architect. After a difficult life and the loss of her husband and near relatives, the client donated a part of her land for a mosque to be built. A temporary structure was erected. After her death, her granddaughter, granddaughter Marina Tabasum architect, acted on her behalf as a fundraiser, designer, client, and builder to bring the project to completion. In an increasingly dense neighborhood of Dhaka, the mosque was raised on a plinth on a side axis creating a 13 degree angle with the Qibla direction, which called for innovation in the layout. Maybe this is related to the, the orientation towards Mecca. A cylindrical volume was inserted into a square, facilitating a rotation of the prayer hall and forming light courts on four sides. The hall is a space raised on eight peripheral columns. An ancillary functions are located in spaces created by the outer square and the cylinder. The plinth remains vibrant throughout the day with children playing and elderly men chatting and waiting for the call to prayer. Funded and used by locals and inspired by Sultanate mosque architecture, it breathes through porous brick walls keeping the prayer hall ventilated and cool. 
natural light brought in through a skylight is ample for the daytime. And now I show pictures of this uh, uh, excellent building built by uh, Marina, uh, a lady who is organized, uh, is recognized internationally uh, as, uh, as, uh, as, uh, as an important architect from Bangladesh. It's kind of uh, almost funny the fact that in you know in a culture where you know some women are not even allowed inside the mosque, here we have a, a, a woman architect building the mosque and build it very, very well. Marina Tabasum, uh, she has other buildings and I don't have here uh, also, uh, you know, profane, so to speak, meaning not uh, dedicated to a spiritual function, like apartment buildings also done beautifully in brick. If you search for her name, you'll discover an excellent architecture. Here we see indeed concrete and brickwork. They coexist and they coexist uh, with the, uh, with, um, uh, it seems with some kind of a, an understanding or empathy between each other. The porosity of the brick wall is enhanced here, but even without, uh, you know, the, the, the obvious penetrations into the wall, uh, the, the brick itself as a material allows for this breathing as it was called. What is interesting also is that even in a not, not too educated uh, segment of society, in a poor region of a country, of a, of a, of a city uh, where you know, there is no knowledge about uh, what we call modern architecture, still a sincere, well-built modern structure could, uh, could uh, uh, satisfy uh, you know, the needs of that um, uh, a segment of society quite well. So what I'm trying to say is that uh, there isn't truly a conflict between, uh, you know, an emancipated architecture and, uh, you know, the level of education of, of, of society. If the building is very convincing, I think uh, society appreciates it, even in the absence of, a, you know, sophisticated or high level of education. Again, concrete and brick, but you see there are no finishes. Both materials express themselves as they are, honestly, sincerely. They are not hidden be behind plaster or I don't know what. And I appreciate this very much because you cannot have a spiritual life without sincerity with a maximum of sincerity and is the same in architecture, I would say. So uh, a brick wall is beautiful as it is. So you can see how it is woven from the small units we call bricks. As for concrete, concrete is also beautiful when it shows how it, would, it came into being and the so-called imperfections of the, of the material, in fact, add to the uh, you know, to the, the aesthetical qualities of the material. And the, and the light, like in this case, emphasizes, uh, you know, adds to the, to the lyricism of uh, what architecture is supposed to do. A brick wall is, if it's done uh, properly, by itself is beautiful. You know, because you see the variety of these small uh, parts of, uh, uh, you know, uh, clay, because this is what a brick is. 
coming together and it's like a woven sweater or a woven anything. You know, it's a textile work. It moves me such picture because you you can tell from the from the neighborhood that this is not an affluent part of Dhaka. There are rich people in Dhaka too, but but this is a you know a very modest neighborhood of Dhaka. But look at the building; it has dignity, it has uh, uh, you know uh, presence, and implicitly I think it educates people silently without words through through its very being there these are modest people you know probably uh, you know without a lot of schooling but there is no contradiction between the building and them i would say the building elevates society if it's done honestly sensitively sincerely it it does contribute silently silently to the uh, you know, uh, an increase in quality, culturally speaking and uh, spiritually speaking. Uh, unfortunately, there is that building on the right. I wish it wasn't there, but what can we do? But this building by uh, Marina Tabasum is indeed uh, deserves uh, the the you know, the award it received from the Aga Khan Foundation for Architecture. And yes, it addresses the needs of the specific religion it was built for, but essentially it is a work which serves the spiritual life of anyone. Doesn't matter to which religion it belongs. This is my belief. When I look at this building, this building is uh, touching my uh, spiritual longing as well. Although I'm not a Muslim, but a, a good building, uh, in my opinion, like good art, does not have frontiers. Certainly not ideological frontiers. Beauty is not uh, ideological, ideological, and it shouldn't be. This building has an effect on these children. Silently, it tells them something about the dignity of being, uh, you know, uh, on this earth without, uh, you know, uh, the contortions of uh, untruth. Unconsciously, I think the building educates those who are around it or inside it. It's a great building. I'm sure Louis Kahn would have liked it too, if he knew it. And this is uh, where it is located uh, on the site plan. I don't I have a picture, a larger picture with DACA from the air or a site plan, but uh, you know this this building brings the dignity of architecture into a I guess a periphery of DACA where you know there was no too much presence of what we call the dignity of architecture. And look at the plan. It's, it's perfectly done. Marina Tabasso. <clears throat> And please, uh, if you do, do not forget, if you can, if you want, 
search for other works by her. I have a presentation on her. In fact, I could have made it, but uh, I didn't think of it. Um, I, I did present her work in the past, and I will again uh, one day. Today, I just show this work by, by this architect. I don't know if the orifice is in the ceiling, if they um, represent anything or, or they are just at random. It's possible that they are at random, unless they represent some constellation, which could be interesting, you know, to have some kind of a vertical dialogue between the earth and, and the sky. Also, the dialectics between the raw or rough and smooth is important too, because here we see the two, you know, the roughness or the rawness of, of the brick um, walls, and then the smooth, um, you know, surfaces, horizontal surfaces. This is for uh, washing uh, the feet. Like a hand woven sweater, a hand woven wall can be very beautiful through the very fact as being hand woven. Now, this is actually the um, um, it's an office also built in, a, yes, it's kind of an office. This is a building I discovered today, um, built by Studio Dhaka in Dhaka. It's a, it's an, a small uh, kind of an office uh, with a destination, with a function, um, you know, for teaching. I guess they rent spaces, uh, you know, with this function to teach. Uh, so I'll read a little bit about it. The project is located at the densest commercial area of Dhaka City and the function and nature of business of TFP, I don't know what this is, is quite in contrast with the site surrounding. It stands out from the surrounding corporate shiny high-rise buildings in its very humble and down-to-earth structure. As it goes, the edifice and the character of its spaces stand out in the utilization and interplay of natural resources like trees, plants, water body, the sun, wind, rain, and shadows. And I, I part of the presentation in the article that I, I read uh, had this um, expression, weaving with nature, which I like very much. And I think it would be very useful for all of us to try to weave with nature. It's very important. So this is the building. It's a modest horizontal building, but again, we see the, the, the warmth of the, of the brickwork left exposed as it should be. We are again in Dhaka, <clears throat> the capital of Bangladesh. You can do very well a building with the bricks obtained from demolitions. Such bricks can be found. They are less expensive and they deserve a new life. And here we see the building 
near the one on the left, which is, uh, you know, excessively optimistic about uh, what we might think progress is. I like much more this modest building, the horizontal building, the one floor building. And I think the tree likes it too. It's very possible that the building, uh, the adjacent building, uh, erased a few tre trees in order to uh, accommodate itself. So weaving with nature is also obtained through this um, interlacing between uh, built rooms, built spaces, and exterior, um, you know, pass passageways or uh, small courtyards. <clears throat> so there is this, we are going to see the plan a little bit uh, <clears throat> later on. And it moves me in a, you know, in a positive way also when I see the signs of the rain you know, the water fallen on bricks. The brick absorbs well, not just air, but also water. Because it is earth. Essentially, the brick is earth. Uh, even if you are not <clears throat> very romantically inclined, you cannot deny, you know, the poetical qualities of, of this courtyard. So again, <clears throat> weaving with nature, what else can we say? I think the more we, we weave with nature, the better. And I would say not only weaving with nature outside of us, but also weaving with the nature within us, because there is a nature within ourselves as well, our soul, our psyche. Our heart, we only think of the brains, but what about the heart? What about the soul? What about our uh, psyche, our psychic uh, reality, which is nature also? So nature is not only outside, it's also inside, inside ourselves. And we neglect it very often, unfortunately. We neglect both very often, and they are interrelated. So you see here the the proud, uh, you know, uh, uh, white building of um, you know uh, progress, and the building which is uh, much more modest, where the trees emerge from the courtyards. It's one floor high. It's it's almost uh, you almost uh, do not notice it uh, from the air, but it's there, and it's so rich in uh, connecting uh, the human beings with, uh, with the outside, with the trees, with the grass, with the flowers, with the rain, with that beautiful intermediary, which is brick. And this is the plan. It's very simple, but I, I, I consider it a quality architecture, very much so. Oh, yes, there is the, a place for cars as well, because it seems we cannot live without cars. Although in the proximity of the um, mosque that um, uh, we saw earlier, we didn't see cars around. And I was very happy to not see cars for a change.
Is it a rational architecture? Yes, it is. Is it a sensitive architecture? Yes, it is. So there is not a contradiction. The reason and feeling do meet here in friendly terms. Weaving with nature, weaving with bricks. It might be that rurality will save urbanity. And if we need nature more and more, because we need oxygen more and more, and we need ozone more and more, then it might be that indeed the village will save the city. And in a way, this is what we see here. This architecture, just one floor high, is in a certain way a rural architecture. But it brings hope in the urban context. Okay, now I'll show another building by these architect Kashef um, Chaudhary Urbana Friendship, a friendship center. The friendship center also in, um, in Bangladesh, but not in Dhaka, near the district town of Gaibanda in Bangladesh is for a not-for-profit organization, which works some of the, um, works with some of the poorest in the country and who live with very limited access and opportunities. Friendship uses the facility for its own training programs and will also rent out for meetings, training, conferences, etc., as income generation. The low-lying land, which is located in rural Gaibanda, where, agricult where agriculture is predominant, is under threat of flooding if the embank embankment encircling the town and peripheries break. And this is the this is the architecture again, you know, very connected to the earth, itself in a way earth. It's a, an, an earthy architecture, but it's also abstract. The geometry is abstract, but the brick intermediates properly between the earth and the you know, the conception of the architect. It's an essentialized architecture. In, in, in fact, some kind of an elemental architecture done with bricks. And it works very well.
They also built a, a hospital, and now I regret I didn't include it. Uh, I was kind of short in time. Uh, I should have, because uh, that hospital also um, is quite a good work by the same um, architecture office. Very similar to this work, actually, except that in the case of that hospital, there is a zigzagging uh, pool of water, which uh, adds uh, uh, you know, an additional quality to the work. Otherwise, it's, it's, it's very similar to what you see here. I, I, I love this picture because, you know, it shows it shows that that good architecture should be for everybody. You know, I mean, if what we read is, is correct, and I imagine is correct, this is in one of the poorest regions of Bangladesh, which is not an opulent or affluent country to begin with. And yet, look at the clothes of these ladies. They themselves are poetical and romantic, if, we, if I am to say so. And so again, there isn't necessarily a relationship between, uh, you know, poverty and, uh, and uh, the lack of aesthetics. With little money, it's still possible to live with some kind of a di some dignity on this earth. The architecture is not expensive. It's done for a not not for profit organization, and the the users of the building also are not, you know, uh, people with means. But but there could be and is dignity, and, and and again, it's important to know that with we are not dependent on the quantity of money that we have at our disposal. It's possible to build even with uh, limited means. You know, Zaha Hadid, she declared that she wanted to build a, a raw, earthy, vital architecture. I admire her trajectory through architecture and her accomplishments, but her architecture was not raw and was not earthy. Maybe if she lived longer, it could have become so, maybe. But here we see indeed an earthy raw architecture, labyrinthical, uh, weaving with the exterior, weaving with nature, weaving with the what we call the exterior space with the outside and uh, uh, it's also maybe some kind of a return to the citadel a different kind of urban conception because we believed in uh, high modernity and uh, not just high modernity but also earlier mod modernity in you know expansion you know in in the suburb in the growing, growing, growing towards the outside without the limits of uh, what in the past was the city walls, you know, the fortifications and so on, like in the Middle Ages. But here we see that there is an enclosure. And within the enclosure, people organize themselves as they need. And it works. I think it works. And I, I think, and I did see actually even some very recent um, uh, proposals for, uh, um, um, you know, uh, uh, urban uh, uh, configurations um, structured within a, a, a very uh, definite uh, perimeter line, like in a citadel. And like we see here as well. It also reminds me of the fact that paradise or the garden of Eden was always depicted in art and maybe in the, imagina in the, in, in the imagination of people, it was always like this, was a, was a walled garden. There was always a wall around the garden of Eden. It was not, you know, uh, uh, 
extending itself uh, ad infinitum. Like in the case of the monastery that we see here, and like in the case of the friendship center that you are you are going to see better in the second uh, in the following uh, uh, image, like here. So the two forms of organization do have this in common that they are strictly delimited at the outskirts. I think here there is a, a, a seed for uh, um, contemplating a different kind of urbanism, a different kind of, uh, of city, actually. Where introversion also plays a role. It's not just extroversion, but also introversion. Now you see the, the plan of the monastery was from um, you know the eighth century, and what you see on the right is from now. So one thousand two hundred more than one thousand two hundred years passed between what we see on the left and what we see on the right. Okay, and now we see the National Library of Bangladesh, and then we'll talk a little bit about the uh, Mr. Islam, a very important uh, architect from Bangladesh, who actually um, uh, built this National Library of Bangladesh. His name is, I don't know if I pronounce his first name correctly, Musarul Islam, a very important architect in, in Bangladesh. But before I show images of the, of, the, of the building, it moves me to see the vitality, the life within the reading rooms of this National Library of Dhaka or, or of uh, Bangladesh in Dhaka. And I only wish that in our University of Architecture here, there will be as many students reading and questing and searching, absorbing knowledge and culture and inspiration as there are in these rooms. And I know that this is not the case. And I wonder why. You see a so-called poor country, but with, with beautiful aspirations, towards knowledge, with curiosity. They want to learn. It's obvious, they want to learn. They don't run on the highway in their magnificent cars. They don't even have cars, I imagine. They want to learn. Now you can see it's a recent picture. This gentleman has a, a mask on his face. It's a country that, that wants to develop and it understands that in order to develop, it needs knowledge, it needs culture, it needs uh, 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 you know, all the information that it needs in order to you know, uh, grow. Again, I wish such a scene can be seen also in the library in our school of architecture. That would be beautiful. And this is the building from the outside, and we are going to see more pictures of this building, um, both here and in the next presentation. Uh, there are articles about this building. Some of I read one article; it, it confused me a little bit because it's it's um, uh, apparently uh, it puzzles people. This building, it's a very large building, as you can see, and it's built with a lot of brick or bricks, but uh, it might even have, uh, you know, metaphorical levels of understanding it that without uh, um, more knowledge, um, it's impossible to, to, to describe them or to anticipate them.
the National Library of Dhaka or the National Library of Bangladesh in Dhaka. And now we go to the second short, very short presentation about uh, Muzarul uh, Islam, this architect who fought to bring modernity to uh, Bangladesh, again, probably inspired by uh, Louis Kahn. And uh, yes, yes, Bangladesh had a, had a great chance to have uh, uh, significant buildings erected by Louis Kahn in Dhaka before he died. In fact, Louis Kahn died in Penn Station in New York when he was returning from Dhaka, where he was expect inspecting the construction of uh, uh, his famed, uh, you know, assembly called uh, building. Muzarul Islam, born in 1923 and died in 2012. This was the man, and he looks like a wise man, not just because he has white hair. Uh, here he is actually with uh, Doshi, Doshi, the, the very important Indian architect who received the Pritzker Prize for architecture <clears throat> and who died uh, a few months ago. Doshi, the first Indian architect to receive the Pritzker Prize and on the left is Mr. Islam. They are together. And, and, and you know, and this, these people through their own example, uh, I think they, they, are, uh, they are mentoring. I read today a beautiful quotation from, uh, the, uh, uh, from Einstein, Albert Einstein. He said, a student is not a, a, a container to be filled with uh, facts or information you know, by, a, by a teacher. It's not a container to be filled but a torch to be lit. It's beautiful because I truly believe it is so. The student is not a container to be filled with info, 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 data, info, info, data. No, it is a torch which must be lit. The student must be a torch to be inspired, that is to be lit, to be brought to fire. This, unfortunately, I'm afraid, is very often forgotten. And the teachers of the world prefer to fill the container that the student is with lots of data, but without lighting up the torch without stirring up the imagination, the spirit, the thirst for knowledge in the student. And that's why some libraries in this world are empty. Anyway, um, now I have a little bit of a problem again because uh, on my screen, uh, and it exasperates me. Okay, I had to move the, the tab in order to see the text. Muzarul Islam, born in December 1923 and died in July 2012, was a Bangladeshi architect, urban planner, educator, and activist. This is very important, and activist, because I truly believe architects should also practice what I call a militant architecture. They should be activists for truth, for justice, for beauty. He's considered as the grandmaster of regional modernism in South Asia. Islam is the pioneer of modern architecture in Bangladesh and the father of Bengali modernism. Islam style and influence dominated the architectural scene in the country during the 1960s and 1970s. Along with major archi US architects, he brought to work in Dhaka. So he was instru instrumental to inviting you know, foreign architects, okay, let's say US architects in this case, the main reference of course is Louis Kahn, but it wasn't just Louis Kahn, to bring them to Dhaka. Um, just a second, please. I don't know why this is not advancing. Yes, as a teacher, architect, social and political activist, Islam set the course of architectural practice in the country, not only through his own many varied works, 
but also through being instrumental in inviting architects like Louis Kahn, Richard, Richard Neutra, and about whom I, I, I will talk tomorrow. Tomorrow it will be, uh, I think, his birthday. Stanley Tigerman, Paul Rudolph, Robert Vogi, and Konstantinos Doxiadis to work in Bangladesh. Well, the most important, in my opinion, on this list is Louis Kahn. Now we look at the College of Arts and Crafts, the Institute Dhaka, uh, uh, in Dhaka, and um, you know it, it's a modern work. It's a work that uh, you know this was his mission to modernize Bangladesh, both through his works and through the architects he invited to work in Dhaka. We arrive at the Bangladesh National Archives and Library. We already saw a few pictures. And here we see this one we saw. Uh, I will come back to this building a little bit later. Here I just show some buildings, uh, the, the names chronologically. Uh, housing for class four employees. Anyway, uh, I don't know if, uh, I couldn't find for all of them pictures. Uh, National Institute of Public Administration building. This is a building in concrete. Uh, I guess inspired uh, to an extent by Japanese architecture of that time, the 60s, the 70s, raw concrete. It pollutes, yes, but at that time uh, this was neglected. In our time, though, we cannot neglect it any longer. I, I like the building in all its uh, roughness. Uh, too bad, yes, that it was built with uh, the sacrifices that uh, building with concrete uh, seem to be uh, unavoidable, and that is uh, pollution. But it's a good building in concrete by um, Israel, by, sorry, Islam. There is brickwork here too, it's not just concrete. And this was the theme of this talk today about bricks and concrete in Bangladesh. I truly think that concrete, if we are to still have concrete, uh, looks good when, when it is uh, not hidden, just like bricks. You know, we, uh, I think uh, maybe Maybe the best, the most emotionally uh, charged architecture in, bri in uh, concrete is the, the one that has a certain level of roughness, like brutalist architecture in concrete, of course. Now, a uh, university master plan and designs, look at the design is, is uh, rotations are very important, graphically and uh, architectonically. I don't know if you realize this, but I like this site plan very much. Maybe there was some influence coming from, uh, from Louis Kahn, but it is the original creation of this uh, architect. Yes, it was apparently, or at least a fragment was realized. Too bad I only have these pictures. I said uh, it wasn't always easy to find pictures, sufficient pictures for, um, uh, for, uh, to illustrate his works. The National Library, I'll show more images. We already saw some. The National Library of Bangladesh in Dhaka. Brickwork. It's a citadel, the citadel of learning. I could almost say the fortress of learning. Uh, it is impressive. So you see the brick allows you to work both for uh, modest programs and also for programs that uh, have a certain amplitude and uh, you know a public dimension even a symbolic dimension you can build monuments with bricks you can build very humble shelters with bricks I don't know if you can see this plan very well. 
In interesting, the interest is through the corners. Uh, Louis Kahn also, where he was accused with the Exeter Library, also with a significant brickwork there, and also concrete work, a famous building by Louis Kahn in the United States, the Exeter Library. It, it, it confused some people because it wasn't very clear where the entrance was because the corners were also emphasized kind of like here. Now, I don't know if the interest, it seems though that the interest is in the center, but I don't know the meaning of those diagonal uh, passages in the corners. Does it matter that the brick wall, wall is not uh, so-called clean, that there are imperfections, uh, maybe because of the elements hitting the walls? They don't bother me at all. You know, I think the a brick wall ages very well because it's made with organic matter or with an organic material that is the brick. It ages well. And the so-called imperfections of the wall, I don't, I, I think we can only be tolerant to these so-called imperfections as Lina Bovardi correctly advised us to be tolerant towards imperfection. especially when that so-called imperfection is, is actually a sign of life and of the passage of time. So it's a monumental building. It's a monumental building, but built with this very modest unit, constructive unit that we call a brick. Miraculous as it is, and it is miraculous. We'll end soon. This is not a long uh, uh, presentation at all, but you know, an introduction to, to, to the work of an interesting architect and the intro, an introduction to the work in architecture in a country which I think has something to say in this field, in architecture. The Institute of Fine Arts, now here we see concrete, we don't see bricks, but we see clearly uh, uh, you know, a new spirit, the spirit of modernity. Yes, the concrete work is uh, affected by the passage of time, by the elements, but the freshness of the conception, the architectural conception is still there. A university, uh, here we see uh, maybe uh, the more pedantic ones will uh, protest, will say no, uh, just a second that here we, we, we see these massive walls affected by, uh, who knows, neglect, uh, bad construction, the elements, it's possible. It's possible, but I think architecture still has force, emotional force. Even if the building uh, seems to be almost uh, abandoned or vandalized, but, but the, the generosity of its conception, I feel it's still present. And you can see it in the drawings. What exactly happened to the building? I don't know. But again, the, uh, the, the architectural essence of the building is still to be seen, is still to be felt, despite the uh, so-called, uh, uh, you know, uh, imperfections of, uh, you know, uh, a rather cosmetical nature. Yes, the building seems to be abandoned or vandalized or both. But I, I think it still moves. It moves me as it is. Brick. Another university, 
this one in better shape. The same architect, Islam. And you can see the nobility of architecture in this work as well. The force of a modernity he believed in. And here we see again the, the way the bricks allow themselves to be woven. At the corners, we see that the touch of finesse, l'esprit de finesse, it's important. And you can do this with bricks. As Boileau said, l'esprit de geometrie and l'esprit de finesse. Eh, l'esprit de finesse, the spirit of geometry and the spirit of fine, fineness. And these delicate um, uh, examples or proofs of, 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 of a graceful attitude towards a wall are important. So it's not just geometry, but it's also the sensitivity that grace makes possible. the force of the brick wall, but also the gentleness of, of some details, like uh, the corners where you see how the, 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 the bricks are woven together. He was a good architect. fighting for architecture, and not only for architecture. He was not a hedonist. He had, as we read, um, you know, concerns about um, social justice. He was an activist, a social worker, not just an artist. And he had the right intuition that Bangladesh would benefit if he invited important architects from overseas or from other countries to contribute to the emancipation in the field of architecture of, uh, of uh, Daga, Dhaka and, Bangla and Bangladesh. Muzarul Islam, 1923-2012. An example, I would say. Thank you.